Good morning. May the God of grace and peace be palpably present with us this day. Welcome to the worship of St. Paul's United Methodist Church, a compassionate community led and transformed by the Spirit. I am Reverend Becky Sweet, and I am honored to serve as senior pastor here and our worship leadership today, for whom we are grateful, includes our ushers and hospitality ministers. Tiglan Chattertayan is our camera operator. David Kingsley is our technical director. Emily Preston is our choir director and song leader today. Diana Breedlove Crouch is our liturgist. The Festival Chimes will be providing some special music under the direction of Dorothy Preston. John White is our guest organist today. Jamie, oh yes, you may clap, it's okay. <laughs> We're glad to have you back, John. <laughs> and Jamie Breedlove Crouch is our prayer leader and our Loving Care Ministries coordinator. And the rest of the staff are listed in your bulletins. I extend a warm welcome to both those who worship with us regularly and to those who are visiting with us here on site as well as online. If you are worshiping with us on site and you are a visitor, I would ask you to complete a connect card so that I may have an address to which I may send a thank you note to give you thanks for your presence with us today. If you are watching on Facebook Live, I'd like to ask everyone to scroll down and leave a comment and greet one another there. And for those who are worshiping via our live streaming, scroll down on the worship page of the church website and complete the virtual friendship pad that you will find there. Also on that worship page, there is a link for our bulletin and our hymns for today so that you may participate fully in our time of worship together. I remind you that the extra candle on the altar reminds us to pray daily for world peace, particularly peace in Ukraine and peace in Armenia where folks are engaged in conflict but also pray for peace in homes that experience domestic violence and communities that are racked by gun violence and in all places where violence seems to be stronger than peace. Pray for God's love and peace to reign. We are so thankful for families who bring children to worship, although I'm not seeing those kiddos right now. But anyway, when the children are here, you can help in reminding them that there is a rack in the back of the sanctuary that contains toys and coloring books and crayons for their use, as well as the preschool room at the end of the hallway by the restrooms where they may play with some toys there. Today is the third Sunday after Epiphany, and our progression of scripture texts during this season, Jesus is continuing to call ordinary folks to follow him in a ministry of discipleship. These unsuspecting folks will be immersed in what it means to be God's beloved community. As we worship our Savior this day, we hear Jesus continually calling us to believe, to follow, to create a countercultural relationship with others around us, which is based on God's love. And so as we begin our time of worship together, I invite you to stand as you are able and greet one another with the love and peace of Christ with a holy wave or a sign from my heart to yours. And let's turn and face the cameras in the back of the sanctuary to greet folks. And together, let's say good morning. And you may be seated as the festival chimes bless us with the centering music.
Would you please rise as you are able and join your voices with mine in our unison invocation? Let us pray together. We thank you, O oh God, for calling us into your church to be your people. We have gathered God of grace and wisdom because we have heard your call. You have reached out to us in Jesus Christ. You have touched us with your spirit, and we have turned toward you, seeking to love as we have been loved. We call upon your holy name. Empower us to worship and serve you, walking gently on this earth through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. May we sing together hymn number 103, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Psalm chapter 27, verses 1, 4, and 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I asked of the Lord, this I seek to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover 
of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. The New Testament scripture is Matthew 4, 12, 13a, 17 through 23. And this is from the message. When Jesus got word that John had been arrested, he returned to Galilee. He moved from his hometown, Nazareth, to the lakeside village of Capernaum. Jesus picked up where John left off, proclaiming, change your life, God's kingdom is here. Walking along the beach of Lake Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, Simon, later called Peter, and Andrew. They were fishing, throwing their nets into the lake. It was their regular work. Jesus said to them, come with me, I'll make a new kind of fisherman out of you. I'll show you how to catch men and women instead of perch and bass. They didn't ask questions, but simply dropped their nets and followed. A short distance down the beach, they came upon another pair of brothers, James and John, Zebedee's sons. These two were sitting in their boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their fish nets. Jesus made the same offer to them, and they were just as quick to follow, abandoning, abandoning boat and father. From there, Jesus went all over Galilee. He used synagogues for meeting places and taught people the truth of God. God's kingdom was his theme. That beginning, right now, they were under God's government, a good government. He also healed people of their diseases and of the bad effects of their bad lives. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Alrighty. We all get to be children of God today, this day and every day, but especially today, you get to give me some responses to my questions. All right, so we've talked about fishing before. How many of you like to go fishing? Besides me, yep, there are a few of us, okay. For those of us that like to go fishing, how many of us fish with fishing nets? I don't either. No, no, I use a fishing rod and, and that's lovely because it's just my pace. I can only catch one fish at a time usually and that's good, I can handle that. What's the advantage of using a net? You can catch more, you can catch a lot of fish all at once. The fish nets that the disciples would have used back in Jesus' day were many, many, many times larger than this fish net. This is just to give us a little bit of a visual. Those were big nets made out of big lines that could, as the scripture tells us in other places, catch hundreds of fish at one time. Sometimes so many, 157 or so, that it would nearly break the net, the scripture tells us. But it can catch many fish at the same time. Now, when Jesus called guys who were fishing along the Sea of Galilee to follow him, he said to them, I will make you fish for people, make you fishers of men or fish for people. Hmm. How do we think, how would they think that they could use their skills as folks who fished with nets to instead change their focus and fish for people. It seems to me like fishing for people requires a different skill set. Would you say that? If you were hiring someone to be an evangelist, would you necessary, necessarily hire someone who only had experience fishing with a net? Hmm, I wouldn't think that would qualify them for being an evangelist. But you know what? Fortunately, I wasn't the one making decisions because Jesus saw something in those fishermen that I might not see. Jesus saw potential in them to fish for people, for the cause of Christ. Now, when I fish, I would use any kind of a variety of bait, 
or lures. So you could use worms, you could use minnows, you could use jigs or spoons or plugs, something like that to attract the fish to my line so that I could catch them. What kind of bait do we use when we're fishing for people? Kindness. And how do we show that kindness? Through our words, our smile, yeah, and through our actions. I passed a lady in Walgreens um, yesterday, yesterday morning, and um, she was a lovely woman, and I said hello to her as she passed away from the prescription counter that I was headed toward, and she came back to me and patted me on the shoulder, and she said, you just have the most friendly-looking face, and <laughs> I thanked her. <laughs> I try to have a friendly-looking face. I thanked her, but you know, sometimes it is that smile that is the bait and, and might attract someone so that they're willing to hear what I have to say and pay attention to what I do as I try to model God's love. That kindness is a modeling of God's love. That's the bait we use. Have you ever thought about how you interact with someone as being your bait? It sounds a little bit crass, but yet, in reality, that's what God is asking us to do. That's what Jesus was teaching the disciples, was how to attract people by the good news that they shared and by the way that they acted. They didn't learn that right away. It took quite a while. In fact, some of that they didn't learn until after Jesus was no longer with them. But eventually they learned, and that's why we have a community of faith now. So think about the opportunity that Jesus gives to us to fish for people, and think about making that offering of bait a natural part of who we are and how we interact with one another. Let's pray, and you may say these words after me. Thank you, calling God, for choosing us and teaching us to catch people for you. Help us, please, to share your love in all that we say and all that we do. Amen.
Thank you, that was beautiful. Would you please pray with me? As that song from our childhood rang through our minds, I will make you fishers of men. As we heard the bells chiming out a call to us to just delight in worshiping you, O oh God, we are reminded that you call each of us in different ways, at different times, to do different things and to be unique human beings, serving you on the face of this earth. Help us to hear your call, to recognize how you desire for us to use the gifts you have given to us, that all the world might come to know your love and your peace. Amen. In some parts of this country, it doesn't really matter. But in our area, the snow and ice, which fall during this time of the year, can and sometimes does bring activities to a decisive halt. I heard that might happen this week, maybe. Schools close, events are canceled, travel becomes trickery, tricky, if not treacherous. If the conditions become severe enough, we have to stay home, or we are told that most people should stay home. When I lived in the North Country, there were times that were so cold, and you're supposed to respond, how cold was it? There were times when it was so cold that they would actually cancel ice hockey practice because it was too cold. Let that sink in. When I lived in Lake Placid, there was an entire week when they closed down the Saranac Lake ice castle because it was too cold for visitors. In the ice castle, it was too cold. In such times of bitter cold and treacherous travel conditions, it is announced that only those who absolutely must should report to work. For those occasions, we have coined an interesting phrase to describe those people upon whom we depend so much. Essential personnel. Essential personnel. This phrase sends some people out in the bitter cold to scrape the ice off their windshields while others stay home in the warmth of their homes and their beds. This phrase compels some people to slip and slide their way to work at all costs while others do nothing more than watch reruns on television of Friends and Big Bang Theory. Even for those who live where it rarely snows, the phrase is a familiar one. When the budget talks collapse and the government shuts down, this is the phrase that is trotted out. Only essential personnel should report to work and they won't get paid right away. When the earth suddenly moves under the people of California, often a certain group of people are called out while the rest are told to stay home. When tornadoes blow and hurricanes roar, only certain people should risk the danger of going out. These are the essential maintenance folks, the road crews, the ambulance drivers, firefighters, electric and gas company emergency crews, medical personnel, and a whole host of folks that we so often take for granted when things are running smoothly. We call them essential personnel. Think about that phrase and think about what it means to be essential personnel. I learned during the early days of the COVID pandemic when we were locked down and told to stay home that I am not considered to be essential personnel despite my own opinion of what I do. 
Does it mean that the world can go on without some of us? The good news is that we are all, or at least all, can be essential personnel. We are called to be a specific group of people and to do some important things as those who follow Jesus Christ. In today's scripture passage from Matthew's Gospel, Jesus called some ordinary fishermen to do the work of kingdom building. Jesus calls ordinary people like me and like you to do extraordinary forms of service. As in the case of the fisher folk, many times we do not need to learn new skills or receive extensive training. Jesus said to them, paraphrasing now, you are fishermen and you've been casting your nets into the sea. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. And they did. They were fisher folk before and they were fisher folk afterwards. But with Jesus, the focus and the priorities had changed. Jesus says to you and to me, follow me. You are essential personnel. Come as you are. Bring whatever gifts and talents you have and use them in my name. Bring your excitement and your enthusiasm and I will channel them in the right direction. Bring your commitment and I will show you where you can make a difference in the world. Bring your love and hope and watch how together we can change lives. Jesus' disciples were not a panel of experts, and we can read that as we go through the gospel texts. They were definitely not an expert at what Jesus wanted them to do. Jesus took people whom the world had labeled in so many ways to be non-essential, Fisher folk, tax collectors, notorious sinners, women who were never considered to be essential before. And Jesus used them and their gifts in doing the work of love and issuing a call to others to follow in the way of Jesus. People who before never felt that they had a place in doing anything important, all of the sudden were lifted up and given an essential job to do. People who doubted that the world even knew they existed were suddenly essential personnel. You and I have been made essential personnel, not on our own merits, but because of a follow me, that we once heard that included us and accepted us and affirmed us. Most of us have heard that voice and those words somewhere along the line. Perhaps the minister told us she thought we would be good at working with children and youth. Perhaps a Sunday school teacher way back when told us that we should consider a call to ministry. Perhaps the woman who sits in front of us in worship said, you would be great in the choir. Oh, she heard us sing. Perhaps the church council endorsed our idea for helping the needy in our community. Some scriptures pointed to an area in our lives in which we could grow in our understanding and our service. It happens in many different ways. So do not be surprised if you hear words calling you to, sometimes directly from God, but sometimes it's from God's saints who are around us every day. Jesus said, follow me. And the exciting thing is those ordinary fisher folk dropped their nets 
and followed Jesus. Simon and Andrew, James and John decided to follow Jesus, but they weren't the only ones. All kinds of people responded. Not everyone decided to follow Jesus, but a lot did. From Simon and Andrew to us, women and men, young and aging, people of all colors and classes have heard that invitation in the places where they live their everyday lives. In fact, Jesus could not stop saying, follow me. It is one thing to ask some fisher folk to come along on a walk along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, but it is another proposition altogether to utter those words, follow me, so freely, almost carelessly, that anybody might answer. We know God loves everyone. We know that in our hearts. But just because God loves everyone does not mean that everyone is going to follow after Jesus. Nor does the fact that God loves everyone mean that we want to see all of them in the crowd with Jesus and with us. So here is where we must confront our prejudices. You see, every time Jesus says, follow me, it affects us as other followers of Jesus. We don't mind Jesus trying to help the prostitute to build up her self-esteem, but that doesn't mean we want her sitting next to us in worship. We aren't bothered by Jesus spending time with those with severe mental illness, but that doesn't translate into our willingness to be more tolerant of the outrageous behavior that this horrible disease sometimes causes. We are glad to see Jesus healing the sick, those who are on death's door, but that doesn't mean we want the house next door to us to become a hospice unit for those with addictions. We sort of like the idea of Jesus, of Jesus letting children sit on his lap, but that's a long way from appreciating the gifts and the presence of children and overlooking the messes created by their celebrations. You know, sometimes things even get broken. When Jesus bypasses the church on his way to eat in the house of the most offensive person in town, we are a little miffed, but not nearly as miffed as when Jesus holds that character up as a better model of faith than us. Yes, we all have some prejudices. Suddenly our excitement over being claimed as essential personnel, people that we would like to think God cannot do without, is tempered by the presence of all those people that we not only have shunned, but tried very hard to avoid being like. Ooh. Am I like them? Mm. Right out in public, where a woman came to draw water, Jesus was seen talking to a Samaritan woman who had been married five times. There's not even room for that on the marriage licenses these days. She had been married five times. And the woman that she was, or the man that she was with was not even her husband. And Jesus said, here, have this sip of living water. One day, Jesus came upon a woman who had been caught in adultery. And she was experiencing what society had determined to be her just punishment. Jesus not only sent the self-appointed jury away, he let the woman go too, 
Neither do I condemn you, he said. Go your way and sin no more. At the most crucial moment, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, Peter denied knowing and following Jesus. And what did Jesus say to him later? Peter, now you go and feed my sheep. The temptation is to think that Jesus used exceptional insight when he looked our way and said, follow me. It is even a greater temptation to wonder what in the world Jesus was thinking about when he called some of those others. But that is not Jesus' problem. That is our problem. And Jesus wants to confront those uncomfortable feelings right along with us. In calling these others, in inviting those that some in society would call the poor and the lazy and the trash of the earth to the great banquet, the eternal reward, Jesus has deemed them to be essential personnel as well. And some of us, sadly, are offended by that. Life in the church would be a lot more comfortable if it were just us, and Jesus would stop saying, follow me, to just anyone who came along. Not only can Jesus not stop saying, follow me, he makes this invitation in such an undiscriminating way that most anybody might show up. At a time when a church any church is knee-deep in advertisements for marketing techniques that are geared to attract people who look and think and act and worship just like us. Jesus is down at the soup kitchen inviting the homeless family to be church. At a time when literature abounds on who can and cannot expect to come to our church as we go through our outreach programs, Jesus insists on knocking on every door in the neighborhood, in every section of town. Jesus calls people that we have forgotten about and welcomes people we too often have treated as non-essential, and we are affected each and every time. We are affected because the call of God through Jesus is a call away from a divided, fragmented world and into one family of God where all have a place and all are welcome. It is a call to share a way of life together that the world has said is not responsible or desirable. But in the church of Jesus Christ, we endeavor to see all as essential personnel. We strive to value what we can learn from one another. We can speak vulnerably about our past and what we have learned traveling through that past to get to today. We can respect one another's fortitude in the midst of unimaginable circumstances. Persons of any age can be identified as wise. Persons who disagree with one another can safely share their thoughts and views as all journey toward discerning God's will. The opportunities to live into God's will are even richer in churches with diversity. Have you noticed that? With diversity of race, culture, sexual orientation and gender identity, educational experience, economic state, age, religious background, and the list could go on and on. Jesus is saying to each and every one, follow me. 
We are not only essential personnel in the work of spreading the good news, we are essential personnel with and for each other. There may be no greater grace-filled moments than when we find ourselves sitting with people we have tried to avoid all these years and learning from them, even as they learn from us. To you and to me, to all of creation, Jesus says, follow me. That is not a call to trail behind Jesus without the intent to share life with one another. It is a call to love as Jesus loves, to welcome as Jesus welcomes, and to take our place alongside our siblings as a church where, for the sake of us all, every one of God's children are essential personnel. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response may be found in the Faith We Sing hymnal on page 2002, I Will Call Upon the Lord. If you are able, please stand as we sing together. are the prayers of our people. Dear saving, healing God, we thank you that you have trusted us with gifts to complete the work you have called us to do. Thank you that you hear our prayers when we pray. And because we pray in faith, we know that you will touch those that are on our prayer list and listed in our bulletin. We pray for David, Larry, Melissa, and Sue. Today we add Mary Boardman and Dick Tabor to our list and ask you to heal and strengthen their bodies. 
For those we hold in our heart that need your touch, we pause as we say a silent prayer for them. We pray for the family of Artie Bennett who passed away recently. As George and Nancy head to Costa Rica to continue their quest to help villages have safe water for all, we thank you, Lord, that you have called them and equipped them as missionaries, and they have answered this call. We pray that you will protect them and keep them safe. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for the end to war and violence in all nations and cities, especially those in Ukraine, Russia, and Armenia. We pray peace might prevail as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We pray that all those that are called by you to fish may follow your call and allow you to show us the gifts you have given us already so that we may be allowed to perfect your will in our lives and the lives of those you have called us to minister to. In Christ's name we pray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We are essential personnel in God's beloved community. That means that the gifts that we have been called to share in the church's ministry are vitally important in making possible a positive impact for the cause of Christ. You may make your offering today using the donate link on the church's website, especially convenient for those worshiping with us online, or you may mail your offering to St. Paul's United Methodist Church. For those in this room, our ushers will be delighted to receive your gifts as the offering plates are passed and as we enjoy the blessing of another musical offering by John.
Please join with me in the prayer of dedication printed in your bulletins. Let us pray. Calling one, you invite us to follow and become fishers of others. You equip us with talents and gifts for our venture. We humbly respond to your gracious invitation and place our gifts to be used at your discretion. As we go out to serve, receive the results of our efforts in your name. Turn them to good where we have erred. Shed light on the path as we seek to journey in your way. Amen. Now listen carefully, I'm going to give you the correct number for our next hymn. It is found in the Faith We Sing hymnal, and it is number 2074, is that right? 2074. We will sing this through twice, shout to the Lord. John White again for making that organ rock. <laughs> and thank you to our festival chimes for blessing us so beautifully. I encourage you to read all of the announcements in the bulletin and in our weekly emails each and every week. On your way out of the sanctuary today, make sure to ooh and ah over the gorgeous watercolor paintings that Rachel Kaufman um, painted and are on loan to us for display purposes. Also, I encourage everyone to come to fellowship time in the memorial room because there we will have a special time of giving thanks to Maud Rith, who has served as our church administrative assistant and communications coordinator. Her last day was Thursday. And while we are sad for us, we are excited for Maud and for the new adventures that lie ahead of her. But we want to thank her very appropriately for all of her service and her ministry among us. And um, we give joy of knowing that she will continue to be an active church member and an active part of this congregation as time goes on. Also, speaking of that, we have some employment opportunities um, for anyone who may feel so gifted and is looking for a position. We have the position for the church administrative assistant and communications coordinator, as well as those for children and youth ministry coordinators. And those um, job descriptions can be found very easily on our website. Right up at the top, there's a little link for employment, and you'll find all all that you need to know right there. Please let others know that those positions are open as well. I would love to have my inbox flooded with applications. 
We are also in need of some volunteers who will give 30 minutes every other week or so in the service of counting our offerings. If you would like to be considered for that service, please contact Rebecca Johnson, Becky Johnson, and she will be happy to help you out and let you know what is expected of you. So next Sunday, next Sunday is the 25th anniversary of St. Paul's Church becoming a reconciling congregation. Yay! <laughs> For those of you who ordered t-shirts, they are here and they are available for you to pick up right outside of Jamie's office door. So please get those. We would like as many folks as possible to wear their t-shirts next Sunday so that we just have an amazing and colorful display in the sanctuary here as we um, have this celebration, which will actually go more than a week. But next Sunday, the other joy is that Rebecca Dolch, who was pastor when you became a, Re a Reconciling Congregation, will be here to offer the message next Sunday. So please spread the word about that and come and enjoy the message that she has to offer. You all know as well as I do that she is an excellent preacher, and I know we look forward to hearing God's word that she will offer to us. And there will be a couple of our laity offering a witness as well about what being a Reconciling Congregation means to them. And you received probably a colorful piece of paper when you came in that says what St. Paul's being a reconciling or fully inclusive congregation means to me. We hope that you will record a word or a phrase or a sentence there about what that means to you and then place them in the baskets right outside the sanctuary door as you exit so that we may include some of what you have shared in our worship services the next two Sundays. But if you can't think of something profound to write today, um, you can write it down during the week and bring it in next Sunday because we had so much to celebrate we knew we could not fit it into one day with Without holding you over for two and a half hours. So we are going to hold it over for a second Sunday. So both January 29th and February 5th, we will be celebrating that St. Paul's is a reconciling congregation with a strong and powerful history and a joy-filled future going forward. Please join us in any and every way that you can. Also, one of our new small groups will be starting up on January 31st, our Fiber Arts group. Anyone and everyone who is um, interested in doing anything with fiber arts, knitting, crocheting, sewing, anything, just absolutely anything. Um, bring something you're working on on Tuesday, January 31st at 11 o'clock. We will meet in the memorial room and we will talk about how often we want to meet together, perhaps a mission project we might engage in together, and so on. Everyone is invited and welcome to come. And I would remind you again that we continue to collect non-perishable food items that are packaged in boxes and bags, as well as hygiene products and non-liquid cleaning supplies for our neighbors as they access them through the blue cabinets. Please remember to bring those in. I was delighted to see two full boxes of things out there today. Bring those in and David will deliver those to the blue cabinets with Holly's driving expertise and um, share those with our neighbors who are in need. And you may read everything else on your own time. Would you receive this dismissal with blessing? Jesus, the light of the world, calls us to follow. Go and tell the good news of God's love. Cast the nets of grace far and wide that all may see the glory of God. Go forth and shine with God's light. May God, source, word, and spirit bless you with the radiance of love. Amen.